Welcome to the Mount Pleasant Public Schools Board of Education special meeting on September 14, 2020 in virtual environment through virtual Zoom meeting. Uh, as a courtesy, please, everyone please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. John, roll call, please. Amy Bond. Here. Courtney Here. Stegman. Here. Brandon McQueen. Here. Thomas Zirkovich here. Sheila Murphy. Here. Motorker. Here. Thank you, John. Um, is there any modifications to this evening's agenda? I've not heard any requests from anyone, but just make the following up to see if any adjustments need to be made for this evening's meeting. Not hearing anything, so we will go on to the next item on the agenda, which is the consent agenda. We have one item, and that is the approval of the August 17, 2020 regular school board meeting. Is there a motion to approve those uh, that item under the consent agenda? So moved, Amy. Second, Sheila. Are there any further questions? John Will Covell, please. Amy Bond. Yes. Courtney Stegman? Yes. Brandon McQueen? Yes. John Mazurkovich? Yes. Sheila Murphy? Yes. Kim Odeker? Yes. Motion approved, and we approve those meeting minutes of August 17th. The next item on the agenda is new business. Jen, we'll let you start. Thank you, good evening. Uh, the first item under new business is a retirement, and I will turn that over to Linda, please. Good evening. Um, we would like to recognize the retirement of Deb, of, I'm sorry, Robin Urban. <laughs> sorry, I'm looking at Deb. Um, Robin has taught with, our, with us for several years, and we are um, very happy that she is um, off to a new adventure, um, but we're very sad that she has left our district. So best wishes to Robin. The board would accept her retirement. Is there... A motion to retirement of Ms. Urban. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. The motion is second. Any further questions? Um, roll call, please, John. Amy Bond? Yes. Courtney Stegman? Yes. Brendan McQueen? Yes. Emma Zirkovich, yes. Sheila Murphy. Yes. Kim Odeker. Yes. And I'd like to acknowledge Robin. She's been an yes. educator to see for many, many years. Yep. Can we hear you? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. All right. Um, we have to thank Robin for her many years of commitment to the kids of our district, and I hope she has a great retirement, and her next adventure is very exciting. Um, the next item on the agenda is probably back to you, Linda, resignation. Yes, um, we are accepting the resignation of Andrea Kissler. Andrea um, was a, a Spanish teacher at Mount Pleasant High School. Um, she is off to a unique opportunity with um, some virtual teaching because that's another area of her expertise. So best wishes to Andrea and we hope we can keep in touch with her because virtual teaching might be something we would need from her someday. Is there a motion to accept the resignation of Ms. Andrea Kistler? So moved, Sheila. Second. I think the second was Brandon, Deb. 
There's been a motion and a second. Are there any further questions? On roll call, please. Amy Bond? Yes. Martin Stegman? Yes. Brandon McQueen? Yes. John Mazurkovich? Yes. Sheila Murphy? Yes. Kim Odeker? Yes. Motion approved. Andrea Buck, and we hope much excitement in your new position that you then I am on the agenda. Are you person? Then I'm assuming that it's back. Yes, we are very excited to add um, several new employees to our district. Um, I will lead them off, read them off in order. Um, we have Marissa Ballard joining us as a school social worker. Megan Phelps joining us as a high school Spanish Spanish teacher. Samantha Schopfer, language arts teacher at Mount Pleasant Middle School. Autumn Slusser, special education teacher at Fancher. Samantha Snow, fourth grade teacher at McGuire. Isabel Stanton, kindergarten teacher at Pullen. Samantha Staub, first grade teacher at Pullen. Brianna Wing Brenner, fifth grade teacher at Fancher and Karen Zaleski, first grade teacher at Poland. We welcome all of those teachers and they are all off and running and getting started with our students. And board members, all of these uh, information on each one of these new hires is in our board packet. I'm sure you reviewed them. Is there a motion to accept the hiring of all of these one, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine new employees to Mount Pleasant Public Schools. Second. So there's been a motion. Are there any further questions regarding any of these candidates? Not seeing them. Um, Jim, roll call, please. Amy Bond? Yes. Courtney Stegman? Yes. Brandon McQueen? Yes. John Mazurkovich? Yes. Sheila Murphy? Yes. Kip Odeker? Yes. Motion is approved, and congratulations to Ms. Ballard, Ms. Phelps, Ms. Schupfer, Ms. Flusher, Ms. Snow, Ms. Dan, Ms. Stobel, Ms. Wingbrenner, and Ms. Lynch. Welcome to the district. We're excited to have you here. Enjoying during an exciting time, so um, thank you for your commitment and looking forward to um, the work that we will be doing together. The next item on the agenda is the ratification of the MPEA Letters of Agreement. Linda, uh, probably John. Yep. I'll start this off and then Linda, I'll probably ask you to join in with me. Um, you have in your board packet this evening two letters of agreement with the Mount Pleasant Education Association. Uh, this is our teachers association. The first letter of agreement is focused on modified expectations for the 2020-2021 school year. We look at um, <clears throat> excuse me, general provisions and general expectations for our teachers, depending on the phase that our region is classified in with the COVID pandemic. So um, looking at um, what we would expect and what would general provisions be in phase four, as long as the Central Michigan District Health Department supports in-person instruction, it moves through um, class limits and um, blended classes, looking also at our special schedule. Specials would be art, PE, music. Um, then we go on, computers, I'm sorry. Um, then we go on into how that might slightly change or might drastically change depending on the teaching assignment if our region moves into phase three, which in phase three, that means we would be closed for face-to-face -face instruction by the health department. Um, we spend a significant amount of time during the months of July and August with our Teachers Association uh, negotiating the details of this agreement, and they did ratify this agreement um, just before we started with students. The second letter of agreement is the shift from elementary music to more of a music and movement program, and I'll ask Linda just to give some uh, summary highlights of that letter of agreement. Okay. Um, that particular letter of agreement, we, we did have um, 
three unique music retires and resignations this last year. And so in an effort to um, sort of be able to regroup our FTE and music, um, we certainly don't want to um, make any changes to the future of our music program. However, with um, some of the hesitation with vocal and choral music at this time due to COVID, we um, asked the MPEA if we could add more of a music and movement class to our elementary world. And so rather than the um, kindergarten and first grade students receiving two music classes, they receive one music class and one music and movement class. And that movement class is um, typically taught by the physical education teacher. So they're getting lots of movement and interaction and still seeing their music teacher once a week. Um, but that has allowed us to um, pause a little and kind of decide what we need in our whole music world K through 12. I don't know if you have any questions yeah. about that. Thank you, Linda. So we're just asking this evening that you approve both of the letters of agreement that have already been ratified by the Mount Pleasant Education Association. Did board members have any questions regarding the letters? We've seen these for a while, so I didn't know if anyone had any further questions. So is there a motion to approve the amended letters of agreement for the COVID three and four and four key music movement. So moved. Second. Amy. Second. Okay. I think Amy was the second. Are there any other questions? John Volkoff, please. Amy Bond. Yes. Courtney Stegman. Yes. Brenda McQueen. Yes. John Mazurkovich. Yes. Sheila Murphy. Yes. Tim Odekirk. Yes. Motion is approved and the letter of verification is approved. Um, Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda. Signatures on those somehow in the next, in near future, but they are approved by the board. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the letter of agreement with the Mount Pleasant Support Personnel Association. Um, and this again is um, an agreement that is focused on the working conditions for our support staff members. Um, if you recall, our support staff association is our second largest association. That's all of our paraprofessionals, secretaries, ISAs, media assistants, kindergarten and paraprofessionals, um, wide variety of staff members in support staff roles. So again, we're looking at um, working expectations, what the employees can count on from the district and what we should be able to count on from our employees as we return to school uh, during the pandemic. So we're asking again this evening that you approve this. This group did ratify uh, the letter of agreement during our, our first week with students. Do we have more members have any questions regarding this letter of agreement? Is there a motion to approve the letter of agreement for the MPSPA? So moved, Sheila. Second. It was Brandon had a second. Sheila moved. Are there any further questions? No, please. Amy Bond? Yes. Courtney Stegman? Yes. Brendan McQueen? Yes. John Mazurkovich? Yes. Sheila Murphy? Yes. Tim Odeker? Yes. Motion approved. The letter of agreement for the MPSPA is approved. Um, thank you all the parties involved, the MPEA and MPSPA, for all the work to get this done in such a fast time. Um, we appreciate your commitment to the district and the working and partners with us in the district. Um, it's been a, a quite a quite a lot of work to get to that point. The next item on the agenda is the Mount Pleasant Public Schools Extended COVID-19 Learning Plan Goal Approvement. Jen. Yeah. So this evening we're going to walk through um, the first part of the Return to Learn legislation that was signed into effect by the governor um, back in August. And we're going to kind of give you a high level overview 
of what this process will look like moving forward. Um, Linda is going to talk a little bit about our educational goals and Joyce Castellan is here this evening to join us to talk more about some of the supports we've already been able to offer um, our teachers and our families. So I am going to share my screen. <clears throat> so basically, as we look at our extended COVID-19 learning plan, that's what this new plan is called. Um, we have several areas of compliance that we have to complete every month during the 2020-2021 school year to meet the compliance requirements of the return to learn legislation. There are three pieces of legislation that were signed into law, PA, public acts um, 147, 148, and 149. And so these reports and the templates that we're going to look at this evening are intended to maintain compliance of those legislative um, public acts. They establish a process for us to update and review our return to school plan, which was a plan we established in August of 2020. And all of these plans are extensions of our COVID learning plan, our continuity of learning plan that we established back in April. The plan has three basic parts. The first is to establish and review educational goals that needs to happen by September 15th. So that's a step that we will be taking this evening. Um, we are need to also establish an extended COVID-19 learning plan. That plan needs to be established, excuse me, and reviewed by the board by October 1st. That plan is not approved by our board. It is approved by the RESD. So that's similar to the plan we did back in April. We are to hold progress reports and show progress updates regarding our progress towards our goals twice, once by February 1st of 2021 and once prior to the last day of school. And then the third requirement is that we hold monthly reconfirmation meetings. Those meetings are to be public meetings where we review the progress of our plan and we allow for public comment. So in order to get this done and in order to make um, progress, we thought that we should use some of the groups that we've already have established in our district as leadership teams, and then also create a separate extended COVID-19 learning plan task force. So you can see there the members of our internal task force, um, both administrators and teachers. Um, I offered this up to anyone that was interested and this is a group that volunteered to join us. I do believe that we will have a couple of other teachers that will be joining us over the next few weeks, but this is a group that is meeting so far. In addition to looking at this information with our task force, we're also reviewing it with our administrative leader te leadership team, and then also our district school improvement team. And if you remember, our district school improvement team does include parent representatives. One of the first documents um, that was provided by uh, MAISA, which is the organization that has provided many of our guiding documents throughout this process, is this timeline. And I know that you all have a copy of this timeline in your board packet. So I wanted just to give you just kind of the high level overview of that. When you see the purple squares at the top, those squares are focused on the initial process of establishing our goals and looking at our learning plan. And again, those steps are the steps that have to be completed um, by September 15th. And then again, um, our plan has to be uh, completed and reviewed by um, October 1st. The, uh, if you continue moving towards the right, um, the squares uh, no later than February 1st shows when we have to provide progress reports on our goals. And then no later than the last day of school, we, find, we provide our final update. And all of this information is submitted no later than June 30th. The second row uh, where it looks at um, within the first nine weeks, that reference is benchmark testing. And that's something that Linda will be talking about here in just a moment. The third row of the timeline looks at the extended plan approval. Every 30 days after that, we hold a reconfirmation delivery of instruction meeting. And I'm gonna go through that template in just a minute so you can see what that looks like as well. So again, this is meant to give you a high level overview of what's expected of us. 
I'm just going to keep going into these documents. You'll see here, we have several versions of templates that we can use. Um, the first is our goal reporting. And really what the goal reporting is looking at is achievement or growth on K-8 benchmark testing. And we're looking at a reading goal and a math goal. So very similar to our school improvement goals that we already have. And you'll see um, as we go down the template, they're looking at breaking it out um, by uh, all students and then by some of our subgroups uh, that we focus on when we look at um, our testing scores. Another suggestion would be that we could continue looking at all of our subgroups and in addition add a subgroup that I think we would find particularly interesting, which is students that are participating in remote instruction versus those that are participating in face-to-face -face instruction. So for us, that would be a comparison of the student groups of the Oilers Online program as compared to the face-to-face -face program. The second template that's here is the actual learning plan template. So I'm sorry, I'll go back. The goal sheet that we just looked at, um, Linda will be reviewing the, the goal information with you here in just a minute. This is the piece that we need to be able to review by this evening or by tomorrow. Um, the next part is the actual extended learning plan. As you review this plan, you'll see the wide variety of state organizations that have invested in uh, the creation of this plan and vetted it to the MDE. Uh, there's a spot for general district information and assurances. And then basically we move into a learning plan narrative. So first they want us to address why we believe an extended COVID-19 learning plan is necessary. We need to outline our educational goals for our learning plan. We need to describe how and where instruction will be delivered during the school year. So this would be the part where we would put in the wide variety of instructional models that we're currently using. We would look at how core academic areas, um, make sure that students are um, exposed to the academic standards. Um, when we look at it a little bit of a different way of counting this year, one of the things that we have to be able to share with MDE is that we are meeting all the standards and benchmarks we've pre previously met. So that's an important section there. Um, this, this next section focuses on reporting to parents. Access to technology and internet looking at how students with disabilities will be provided equitable access to instruction and accommodations. And then the last section would, it would address how we would meet the needs of any of our other vulnerable populations or subgroups, um, economically disadvantaged students, English language learners, at-risk students, and that sort of thing. So this is the 12-page plan that we will draft and send in um, to the RESD um, after it is reviewed by you. And our plan right now is to review this plan um, at our meeting um, next, at our meeting next week. And let me just see, I'm trying to get back to the PowerPoint and it's not letting me. Okay, sorry. Oops. Then the last template that's on this sheet is the reconfirmation meeting template. And again, I, I think it's really important to remember that all of these items, all these templates are for, um, are for compliance with legislation. So that's um, you know, what we're doing here, what we're looking at. Um, so this reconfirms how instruction is going to be delivered during the 2021 school year. Again, we allow public comments from parents, guardians, or any uh, community members on the extended learning plan. And then we review uh, weekly two-way interaction rates. So one of the ways that we are being charged with counting students and making sure that we're measuring student engagement is measuring that two-way interaction between a student and a, a teacher. So again, you can see the chart here where we're looking at options of how we'll explain how the plan is being delivered during the school year, documenting public comments, and then reviewing all of our two-way interaction rates for the previous week, 
and they want this in a percent form. There are options where we can break down the two-way interaction rates by grade level, and that would be this, uh, this second set. Um, so this is going above and beyond the strict adherence to legislation. So I'm gonna ask Linda to jump in maybe here and talk more about the goals that uh, we've established based on recommendation from the RESD and from uh, our school improvement plan. Hello, yeah, I think Jennifer hit all of the high points um, very well as far as we, the last thing we need right now is something new and we wanna continue to talk a language that our teachers are comfortable with and all of our buildings have excellent school improvement plans. You've heard from Kim Funnel over the years, our director of state and federal programs presenting our, our district school improvement plan, which all of the building plans funnel into. Um, so we, a basic goal that we've had for years and that we continue to strive towards is that all students in Mount Pleasant Public Schools are career and college ready in reading, and there's a target grade date of 2022. We have that same wording, all students will be career and college ready in math by 2022. So these goals would continue to funnel into our school improvement plan and, and we'll use that same language. Specifically NWEA, which we've used for years, um, our goal is always to meet our students where they are and help them exceed their potential. And of course, since our, um, our goal also is to hit some of those NWEA benchmarks. So for example, um, a kindergarten mean RIT score um, is 136. So collectively, we, we hope that when our students come in, they are you know, hitting that mean score. By the middle of the year, that changes to 146, and that kind of tells us if our instruction is on, growth, on target with that group as a whole. What's interesting this year is that the last time NWEA um, had normed their data, it was 2015, and this year we have a new set of norms. And it, it's quite a significant shift from the 2015 um, data norms. Um, so I think we wanna make sure we stay the course. We're gonna keep talking the language of NWEA, and that language also is something that we are very used to talking to parents about at parent-teacher conferences. They're used to getting those student progress reports. And we are also um, using that as a reflection tool for um, the, the teacher evaluation component of student growth. Um, we've disaggregated students into small groups for years. Um, we have to disaggregate students that are in subgroups of 30 or more so that it's st statistically significant because we want to make sure that our aggregate population is hitting the target, but we also want to make sure that all of our subgroups are also hitting those same learning targets. So we hope to stay the course and continue to talk the, the NWE lang NWEA language. Thank you, Linda. Um, as we move on, um, one of the things that we talked about with our task force is that while we believe that this information um, is very important as it is required by state law, we also felt like there were data points that we believed were important that maybe weren't included in them. So we started to look at important internal data points and we brainstormed a list of what other data points we would like to include in our weekly, or I'm sorry, our monthly reconfirmation meetings. So we thought about looking at student engagement data, again, going back to that two-way uh, communication data. We also, uh, wanted to look at our project aware data. I believe that you all know this, but our project aware team submits monthly data for the goals of the project aware grant and they're looking at students that have utilized supports, resources that have been provided to students and a wide variety of different things that are specific to the project aware grant. So we felt like since that data was already being collected, we could continue collecting that. Uh, we also wanted to look at our attendance data um, beyond just that virtual two-way communication piece. How is our attendance data? Uh, social emotional learning, as you know, we've adopted the second steps curriculum. So I wanna make sure that um, our students are engaging in that curriculum, uh, K-8. Um, also looking at breakfast and lunch participation. Just last week, we learned the very exciting news that we're able to provide free breakfast and free lunch to all students 
um, likely through the end of December of this year. So we really wanna look at those participation rates and try to determine has that gone up, has that gone down and what can we do um, you know, to increase that participation. And then also discipline referrals, although that's not the best source of data, uh, we do like to continue using um, discipline referrals as other data that we would use. Um, we also then wanna make sure that we are reviewing our feedback from staff. We're working on gathering feedback on a regular basis from our staff members so that we know what things are working well and what things aren't and what we need to improve. So again, if we look at our additional points for consideration, this is the same information we've looked at quite frequently that you know, as we make these decisions, we really need to keep for in front of our minds the health and safety of our students and staff. That's something that that's not going away as a primary focus for our plans. We also wanna make sure that we're addressing the needs of all of our families, including working families and those with at-risk students. We wanna make sure that we are um, continuing to be able to provide rigorous high quality instruction for all students. We wanna be able to support all students in a virtual learning environment. Uh, we wanna look at family preferences. That's something that we wanna be able to offer instructional delivery modes that meet families' preferences. We wanna give teachers and staff preference of instructional choices. We wanna be able to offer consistency in programming. And then we wanna make sure that we're monitoring those data points uh, that are important when moving into a new instructional model. Some ongoing work and some ongoing, um, you know, items that we're looking at here. Um, first of all, we wanna continue uh, reviewing enrollment numbers. So I just wanted to give you a very quick snapshot of our enrollment numbers for face-to-face -face students and Oilers Online. Um, this is not audited information. This certainly has nothing to do with count, but where we stand today, uh, we're still looking, you know, at, at roughly right around, or just over a third of our students are in the Oilers Online program as compared to um, our face-to-face -face program. We wanna continue to determine creative ways to offer support for our teachers with blended rosters, and then also our teachers with large class sizes. We know that's a challenge, and so we're working every day to try to figure out other ways to offer support uh, for our teachers and for our students. Um, we need to be able to gather feedback and, from our staff and from our families as we look at second trimester. I know we've only completed two weeks of school, but I also know that November 13th will be here before any of us can blink. So we wanna be prepared to say, okay, what happens when we move into our second trimester? When we planned and made this plan, we looked at that 12 week window to be able to say, what can we do well and what commitment can we make for 12 weeks? There are a lot of unknowns that will definitely impact us. Um, you know, certainly we don't know what's going to happen with the pandemic. We don't know what's going to happen in our community or in our region, but we wanna be able to use that natural break at the end of the trimester as an opportunity um, to look into how we're doing and what we can improve even more. So one of the big areas that we've noticed just in the first two weeks is uh, that we have a need to offer technology support to our teachers and families. And so I, uh, Linda asked Joyce to join us this evening to talk a little bit more about what she's been doing during the first two weeks of school to support our teachers and our families. So Joyce, um, you can I'll ask you to unmute and I've got the schedule that you created. Um, sure. Support. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, so thanks, Jen. Um, thanks for having me and I'm happy to share what I've been working on the past couple weeks in between uh, everything else that, I've, <laughs> that I normally do at school but I have created a calendar and linked to appointment slots where families or teachers or parents or students can sign up for a half hour time slot. And that could be a Google Meet, it could be a phone call, or it could be in face-to-face -face at one of the building locations. So I picked a building a day for seven days and that's where I was stationed. If a parent wanted to come in and get some help with the device or I scheduled Google meetings. Um, I had quite a bit of takers on my um, calendar appointments and was able to help uh, quite a few families out with their technology questions and getting logged in.
questions they had about their district device. Um, had a couple of girls that were struggling to get on. They had one device between the two of them plus their own tablets and we got it to work so they could get on their class meet with their own tablets and they were so excited and so happy that they could finally be separate and not have to be sitting together <laughs> during their class meet. So that was a lot of fun to see the excitement in their faces. Um, and then the other thing that I have done besides offering these half hour appointments is we created a survey that's been sent out to our Oilers Online families and the blended families. Um, where they can submit a quick, here is my name, my contact information, and I've got a list of frequent questions that I've been seeing. And um, somebody, whether it's myself or uh, Joe Judge or one of his team, everybody can take a look at the spreadsheet and kind of divide and conquer and reach out to the families as fast as we can. And we just kind of keep track of who solved the problem and make sure that everybody's taken care of as they're submitted. So. Thank you, Joyce. Yep. So we have representatives that will, that are here this evening that have joined um, from our administrative leadership team that would be able to answer your questions. Of course, myself, Linda and Joyce would be happy to answer any questions um, that you have. I'm gonna stop my screen share. Uh, so that we can see one another but um, that's where we are with the update for our return or i'm sorry our extended covid 19 learning plan um, we do need um, your support for our educational goals this evening um, although there is not a requirement for a formal vote on them if you wanted to do that you could but i think the idea that um, our school improvement plan is already voted upon and just that we've presented it at a meeting and there's general support um, is enough to be able to move forward. So we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. General Linda, could you just once again, just review those goals that you highlighted just so we, you gave us a lot of information. Can you just kind of bring our focus back to those goals specifically? Based on this COVID learning plan, the emphasis is definitely on reading and math. And so everything in this, um, basically this expectation is something that we already do. We will have our benchmark testing in reading and math. Um, we actually were gonna purposely delay that just a little so that we could really focus on getting our students comfortable in the building and, and really focus on their socio-emotional well-being and safety and all of our protocols. Um, so the fact that they allowed us that 30 day window, we're still well within that time frame to do our NWA testing. And so, you know, our students will improve in reading, our students will improve in math. Um, our bigger goal with school improvement is that all of our students will be college and career ready in reading and math as well. So, does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you. Does any board members have any questions regarding these specific goals that we have to establish for our extended learning plan? So, and again, we would revisit these goals once in January when we would have fall data and winter data to share. And then we would also revisit them again, um, probably in May when we have our spring data to share. So right now, this is a template and the majority of the template is blank because we don't have any of our benchmark testing done yet. But as we complete that, we will share that with the board as well. Did anyone have any questions? I have, I have a couple. Um, one is, and I've been asked this question, um, how, how are we going to be giving the MAP test, the NWA MAP test? Um, do they all have to come into school? And that's been the question that's been asked. And I didn't know if there was any clarity you could provide for that. I think either Joyce or I could answer that. So obviously our students who are face-to-face, -face, we can spread them out. We are doing the social distancing in the classroom with their Chromebooks. So that will be the process that we've always offered. Um, the, let's see if I can get this straight. The six, seven, eight students are going to be doing the remote option. And Joyce is able to set up a remote link and she can even do the proctoring 
thanks to technology to proctor those students um, remotely. So they'll, the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students will not be coming into the building for their MAP testing. Um, the third through fifth Euler online students, um, Mrs. Rinke and Mrs. Renaud are hoping to offer an in-person session. We may be able to organize a testing day at Mount Pleasant High School, taking advantage of the day that they do not have students. Um, they would like to carefully bring those students in and perhaps use the media center, room 111, or some of the computer labs at the high school when our own stu our students are not present. Um, and then that way, the Euler online teachers and the principals and Joyce can help proctor that. And then last but not least, the K-2 students, um, Mrs. Stout, Mrs. Halsetta, and uh, Mrs. Bishop are going to organize days where those K students can come in on a very organized schedule and take the NWEA test in the title classroom, perhaps in the library or the cafeteria, again, organized and socially distanced um, on the days that they determine that, that will work for their building. I think that's everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Another question I had is I noticed that the law only requires us to set a goal for our K-8 students. It doesn't have anything for the high school. Is that correct? That is correct. So that's one of the reasons why our task force also wanted to identify those data points that we feel are important. So when we're looking at, especially at student engagement and attendance, given the hybrid model that we're doing at the high school right now, we really want to be able to look at what that engagement um, looks like and um, what we can do to help improve that. So we will focus on those, those additional data points that I shared. We will focus on our high school students as well for that portion. Do board members have any questions regarding the goals for our extended plan? And how some of the data points actually that we're going to be using to, to report back to the board, but also to the public, because the public gets the opportunity to have comments in this conversation along with the educators themselves. And we get that information on a monthly basis. Any since, questions? We're just, since we're just starting this process too, if there are any data points that you would be interested in us including that I didn't review on that list. Um, certainly, you know, if you wanted to reach out to me and let me know, um, we could add anything else that you might be interested in. That was just a list that we brainstormed uh, with our task force. When are you estimating, Jen, to have the kind of the main part of the body done by? So October 1st is when it goes to the ISD. It, yeah, it has to be to the ISC by October 1st and it has to um, be on our website by then as well. So um, my plan is to uh, bring the full 12 page template uh, plan to you next Monday um, so that we don't have uh, an additional special meeting. So I'll, uh, we've got the, a draft that we're working on right now that we'll finalize and get to you um, with your board packet on Thursday have you review that um, and go through that together next Monday, September 21st. And then our, um, our uh, reconfirmation meetings would be at the second board meeting of every month. Um, right now, it's still a little bit unclear if we can hold the, that reconfirmation discussion at a regularly scheduled board meeting or if we have to do a special meeting. Um, but for now, I'm planning on just doing it at our already regularly scheduled meeting so we don't have additional meetings, but it would be that second meeting of every month and then that would allow us to meet the 30 day requirement. Thank you and a clarification. So you're not looking necessarily for a board vote since the ISD is who does the approval of the plan. You're just making sure that we're well informed of what our goals are that you've established. Correct. It is awkward because if you think back to the um, the continuity of learning plan that we did in April, remember you didn't approve that plan either, the ISD did. And then the return to school plan that we did in August, you did have to approve and we had to submit it to the ISD, but they didn't have any approval process for that. And now this uh, reconfirmation plan and this extended COVID-19 learning plan this is ISD approved again. So um, I'm struggling to keep all the names straight, so I imagine other folks are as well, but, but um, in the sample template that they provided to us, that MAISA provided, 
they multiple times referenced the col plan from april and the return to school plan from august so the three plans are connected so the fact that you did approve the return to school plan um you know sh shine some endorsement on it but that's why we need to make sure that the board's well informed and that any questions you have are answered well before october 1st when we have to send it to the isd um, but it is i it's a little awkward how the approval has moved around Yes, it is, but thank you. Any questions regarding this process of the extended learning plan and or the goals? Also, was there any questions regarding the rest of the presentation, for example, the stuff that Joyce presented on the technology and or on the rest of the information that Jennifer presented on kind of the status of the district right now and how things are going? So I'm not hearing anything. Do you want to add is there a question? I, I think I have a big delay, so that's why I'm pausing so much. Um, uh, the only questions that I've been receiving that I didn't know if you could just talk to briefly, and you did actually in your presentation talking about the, the district constantly reviewing where things are, um, that some of the struggles with the hybrid structures, um, and didn't know if you could give some kind of an update on um, um, how that's going and um, some thoughts on where that may end up going um, as we move forward. And um, I've been telling people that we're still trying to progress with everything. And so um, everything's hopefully getting better. So I didn't know if you just wanted to briefly update on that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I do believe um, things are getting better, but, but I think that we do need to look at ways that we can provide um, additional supports for our teachers. Um, I think the biggest area where we're hearing concern from both teachers and uh, families is from those that are teaching the blended roster. So that means they have students that are face-to-face -face and then also students that are in the virtual program. Um, and so when we look at different options for what we can do to either provide more support or to change that instructional model, um, the response that uh, we're, we're often told is, well, just hire more teachers, hire more teachers. Um, that's a struggle for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, we, we uh, Linda just went through a great list of candidates that we just hired this evening, um, but finding teachers has, has been a struggle. Uh, there aren't teachers out there that are waiting um, in the wings like we have had in previous years. So finding teachers and then knowing that if we were to hire new teachers for the online program, not knowing uh, what might happen down the road if we move into phase five, what that might look like. Um, would we have teachers that we would then have to lay off or would we have a financial commitment to these folks for the year? And uh, just trying to weigh the pros and cons of that has been a constant conversation point. Um, the other point uh, or the other suggestion is looking at our enrollment and looking at the number of students in a grade level in the online program to see if we could make a complete virtual section um, and then have the face-to-face -face sections perhaps increase in size. So for example, we have four sections of a grade level, take all of the online students that are in each section, make them one online section and take one of the teachers to just do an online section and then have the other three teachers that are remaining teach with slightly larger class sizes. The problem with that is that we can't do that and maintain six feet of distance in our classrooms. So um, Linda and I are literally looking at numbers every day to see where students have shifted um, to see what might be possible because we do really want to hold true to that commitment we made to you that our students would be six feet apart at all times. And so trying to find that balance. Um, the letter of agreement that you ratified this evening um, does include paraprofessional support for those teachers that are teaching fully online classes with a larger class size. So that's something else that we've looked at. Can we provide more paraprofessional support to our teachers with blended rosters? And when I say paraprofessional support, we're actually looking at models where we, we could provide additional certified teacher support through our specialist teachers that maybe have additional FTE in their schedule or even through our Title I teachers that could come in and offer support either to face-to-face -face students 
or to virtual students. Um, so there's a wide variety of options there that, that we're, we're looking at, we're trying to determine what would be best. Um, although it feels like we've been at this a long time, I think it's important to remember that today is only the ninth day of school. Right, and so we're, we're trying to make all these shifts. We also have had a fair number of families that had originally signed up for the online program that realized very quickly for one reason or another that that program just didn't work for them. So whatever the reason, they contacted us right away and said this program isn't working for my family, it's not working for my child, can we look at um, you know, bringing our children back into the, the classroom. And so we've been able to do that in some cases. Um, in fact, at the middle school, we were able to bring in a whole section of students, um, 25 students that were in the online program that were able to come back into the cohorted program. Um, but we don't have that flexibility in all of our classrooms. So all of our buildings have been maintaining waiting lists. They've been reviewing that waiting those waiting lists to see if they can bring students back. And then at the same time, we have had students that have said, I'm not comfortable any longer going face to face. So I want to go back. I want to go to a virtual setting. So as much as we can, we've tried to flip those students as well. So um, like this whole situation has been since March, it's very fluid and we're trying to be accommodating as much as possible. Um, so there, there are a lot of moving parts to it, but we're meeting regularly, we're brainstorming um, for those teachers that have reached out with concerns. I've sent um, correspondence back to them asking for their suggestion. I know that grade levels have met to problem solve and create ideas uh, to help try to help us as well. So um, that's, that's yeah. sort of in a nutshell where we are with all of that. Jen, I guess kind of clarify for me, when we're talking about taking all the online and putting them into one class, mm -hmm. why does that increase the class size for the face-to-face? -face? Sure, because so in the, I'm just giving a, an example or a hypothetical, this isn't any particular grade mm -hmm. level, but say we have, we have four sections of a grade level and each section has, let's say 15 students that are face-to-face -face, and then each teacher has five students that are online. So their total enrollment is 20 for each class. If we took one teacher and took the five students out of each section and made them all online, that would be 20 students for that online teacher. But then the 15 face-to-face -face yeah. students would have to go back into the three other sections. Okay, yeah. how many, how many, because um, I, from my understanding, it's mostly the K through two. Correct. How many of those, um, have that kind of a problem or I mean for instance if we just had to hire one new teacher would that fix the problem or would are we looking at we'd have to hire three two new teachers when when I did the math on Thursday which which could change but I wanted I wanted to look at the numbers and have the math clearly laid out because we had an administrative leadership team on Thursday afternoon to, to mm -hmm. move all of those students into full virtual sections, we would have to hire six new teachers. Wow, there's that many. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you are right, the, the way that, the way that um, numbers worked out, um, it is primarily at the kindergarten, first and second grade level where we have the bl blended rosters. There are some blended rosters um, at the middle school and at the high school as well, but we don't seem to have the concerns, which, which obviously it makes complete sense. Those students are more independent. Our youngest students, um, you know, need the help and need the yeah. support. Um, and, and so it's, it's just a struggle. So um, I think we had in our mind that it was a good model that class sizes were small, um, but then when you put the blend in, it's just really overwhelming. Um, and so we're, we're trying to do everything that we can, but I don't know that we'd be able to find six teachers. Yeah, I was going to say, if it was one or two, um, right. I guess the other suggestion was, could they, you know, give them an extra hour, I don't know, maybe we have the parapro para come in for an hour, so that gives them more time to plan, or, you know, if you even lessened one teacher's, I don't know, it's, yep. without having the numbers, it's hard to tell, but yeah, it sounds, and especially in that lower L class, I can see why that that's such a problem because so much of it is visual learning. Yes. So, so it, it really just, is just complex. Us, yeah, just keep us informed 
and mm -hmm. and I want them to know that we care and and that we're trying to fix the problem and that we acknowledge that it is a problem and you know if there's something that we need to do you know mm -hmm. definitely let's mm -hmm. do it i knew it i it's crazy period yeah i would just second that in the sense that um the people who have been reaching out to me uh that's the same thing i've been hearing um, honestly, not just our district, but I've had teachers in other districts tell me that um, doing online and in-person classes feels like having two jobs. And that is pretty overwhelming. Yep. Yep, definitely. I, and I, I guess I'm thankful that our teachers are coming forward, um, sharing their concerns and also sharing suggestions for things that we look, can look into to resolve the problem. And I also think across the board, I mean, it's a true testament to the professionalism of our teachers when they're coming to us saying, no, first of all, that I love my job, I love my students, I love my school, um, but I'm overwhelmed. And so I think they need to know that we do hear them and we understand and we're trying to problem solve solutions for them. Thank you, Jen. Does anyone else have any questions? So we are going to transition now. We have a board appointment process that we need to go through. Um, and so the, the candidates just to know that we're going to get ready to answer, ask questions. Um, just to recap a couple of things. Um, um, Beth Lawrence and Prince uh, uh, resigned from the board for personal reasons. Um, and we have 30 days that we need to appoint a new board member. Um, we announced this to the public and um, in the paper and on our websites and other avenues. And we had three candidates who stepped forward and provided a cover letter and a resume and stated their interest in being on the school board. Um, these cover letters and resumes have been shared with all the board members. So we've had a chance to review them prior to this meeting. Um, and so the next step in the process is they've been invited and they're here this evening. Uh, and they will be brought in um, to our panel space. And we have a series of questions. Um, there are seven questions that we've um, asked of all of our um, 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 candidates that we've had in the past for quite a few years. So they're standard questions that we've always asked um, our candidates. Um, and we will go through and ask each one of the three candidates um, these same questions. And then after that, the board will debate and determine, um, one, if there is a candidate they wish to move forward to be the next board member. And or two, is there more questions or anything else that we need to know to help make that decision? Um, but also do know that I think we are abutting the 30 day already. And so we are on a tight schedule that we need to make this determination. Um, a couple of other things just to let the public understand. Um, uh, the two of the three candidates who've come forward for the appointment um, are also running for school board and the November elections. And so we've had conversations with our legal counsel on how to do this process um, if they were to get elected and or um, appointed. Um, I mean, so we've talked to, we'll talk to them and each of the candidates know these, what's going on and how this is gonna move forward. Um, but in general, um, the candidate, let's say if the candidate who we've appointed is elected, um, that candidate will get the choice of being in the remainder of that two year seat they were appointed or they could choose to do the six year term for their elected component. If they choose to do the six year term in January, we would have to appoint another candidate to fill the remainder of the two year seat. Or one of the things that we were getting some clarifications on is whether the, the elections have some kind of trumping um, in that process. Um, if they so choose not to, to take the role. Um, and so do we go to the fourth candidate on the list and we're getting clarification on some of that. So there's uh, some intricacies that are unique just because of the year, because school board members are only elected in the even year elections. Um, so we have windows that we have to work within um, and six year terms that we also have to work within. And so we're trying to resolve some of those further questions. However, we do have three candidates for this evening, and these three candidates are, are, are excited to be having the opportunity to do this um, for their school district and the children in our district. Um, and so um, we will have uh, the list of questions. And so um, um, historically board members, what we've done is 
um, I ask the first question, then somebody else asks the next question. So instead of assigning, if someone just would like to jump in as we go down the list, um, and so it's not just me asking the questions all the time, that would be helpful. Um, and the candidates are actually on the agenda. And the candidates who are coming forward for um, um, appointment are Ms. Audra Drain, Ms. Jessica Jernigan, and Ms. Wileen Pangle. Um, these are the three candidates. Um, and since they're in that order, we will start with that order on the agenda. So we will have Audra come in first, and um, we will ask, I'll ask the first question. Um, and then hopefully, if you have questions, candidate, please ask when you're, you're given the opportunity for your window of time. Um, and we will rotate through all three of you. Um, and in general, probably about the same amount of time. So Jen, can you find if Ms. Drain is? Yep. Available. Audra, I think I, I know think she's you're in the, on the meeting. Yep, Audra, you're on the meeting. Can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Okay. Welcome, Audra. Hello. Thank you for uh, stepping up and um, offering to be on the school board. We appreciate that. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. So um, um, we're going to start right, jive right, jump right in. So the first question that we ask are, is, why are you interested in serving on the school board? Well, I would say I have lived in Mount Pleasant my entire life. Um, I went through Mount Pleasant Public Schools myself. Um, and I just wanna do my part in keeping this district the place that I decided was best for my kids to go through. Um, and I wanna be a part of pushing us further in the future. Thank you. Does another board member want to ask question number two? Hi, my name's John. Um, I've been in your shoes a couple times now, I think three. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have a little experience on the other side. John, you muted yourself. What are the challenges currently facing Mount Pleasant Public School District? Um, I mean, obviously COVID and all the things that are coming along with that. But outside of that, before COVID happened, I would say a challenge facing every school district is budget and trying to do all the things that we want to do for our students and our families on such a tight budget. Um, and something that I think I've noticed in the last few years is that um, with the increase in the opiate epidemic, um, how that is affecting our students and our students' families and what can we do to support them in that. Thank you. Okay, I'll jump in there. Um, what's, what do you consider our greatest strengths? Easily our staff. Um, like I said, having gone through the school district myself, there are some teachers that I'll be super sad if they retire before they can teach my kids. Um, I think that our staff, both administrative and our teachers are absolutely incredible. Um, the way that they love our kids, the way that they love on their kids' families, um, they go absolutely above and beyond what I can ever expect of them. Um, teachers are absolutely my heroes, and I think that we have an incredible staff of teachers. You guys, I'm uh, in a situation where I have to use my phone, so I don't have the list of questions in front of me. You're going to have to pick it up for me. No problem, Brandon, I'll grab it. What would you like to see changed in the district and how do you envision your role in that change? I would say rather than changes necessarily, there are some additions that I would like to see in our school district. Um, and I'm absolutely well aware that there are more of long-term goals than things that can be adjusted right now. So as far as my role in them, even if I'm just the person who plants 
the seed of the idea that could eventually grow, I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, I definitely would like to see us as a district offer ASL as a language credit. Um, I think that that's something that is going to be the future of education in America, ASL being something that everyone should know. Um, and I'd also like to see some district-wide assemblies um, that can address like the diversity and I would like them to be interactive so that students can not just be talked at by the person that's giving the assembly but you know you can ask them questions and they can raise their hands and look around and see all of their peers that they thought were completely different from them actually have a lot in common um, and so that's kind of a way for us to stimulate their emotional well-being and maturity um, and I would also like to see, I know that's something that's coming up anyways, some adjustments to our sex education program. I can jump in there now. Um, how do you view the relationship between the Board of Education and the administration staff? Um, I think that that open, open line of communication all of the time is super important. I myself would like to think that the staff would know that they could call me, email me, text me at any time for really any reason and that I would be there for them. I will go ahead and John, why don't you go to number six? Just looking for the mute key. Um, so why would why should we select you over the other applicants? I think that question is the toughest question for me. Um, <laughs> I haven't heard the other applicants speak, so I really can't have an informed opinion on that at this moment. Um, and I'm not the person that's going to put their ideas down anyways to make myself shine brighter. I have full confidence that the board will make the best decision for our district on their own without any extra push. Thank you. Can we take the last one here, Tim? Yes, go ahead. Is there anything else you want us to know that might help us with this decision? You know, I think I'm good as of now. Well, Audra, thank you very much. Again, we appreciate you stepping up. It takes a lot of courage to step up to um, be a candidate to uh, be appointed for school board, and we appreciate that. And we appreciate you being a family in, in our district. So thank you very yeah, much. Thank you very so much. So next, we have Jessica Jurgen. Hello. Hi, um, Jessica. How are you? I, I'm waving. You can't see it, but... Um, I am a mom in a household with two working parents. Uh, now that my son is in high school, I have more time to devote to community service. And I think that the school board is a place where I can be most useful. Um, my husband's a teacher. I've done volunteer teaching myself. I am the product of an excellent public school education. I really care about education. I also understand that in addition to being places where students learn core academic subjects, Schools are also a vital part of our civic infrastructure, and I think the whole country got an abrupt education in everything schools do when schools close in the spring. Um, in attending the school board meetings in late July and early August, I got a new appreciation of how important it is to have clear two-way communication between the board, school administrators, teacher and staff, and the larger community. My professional career about communication and connection and I think I have skills to offer that will help the board for the Jessica, I think we're having some connection issues. Oh no. <laughs> um, so can you start back? You said you were talking about your clear communications and your ability to communicate and then we lost you. Um, 
I am a communicator. I make connections, although apparently right now I have a poor connection. Um, that's what I do in my profession. Um, and I think that I have skills to offer that will help the school board fulfill its mission. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. John, next question. Hi, Jessica. Um, what, do you, what do you feel the um, challenges are that are currently, the, let me restate the whole thing. What are the challenges currently facing the Mount Pleasant Public School? Um, I think that maybe we all agree that the most immediate challenge facing our schools is the pandemic. Um, we have confirmed, uh, confirmed coronavirus cases have been increasing in Isabella County, as well as surrounding counties. Um, Alma has been forced to close an elementary school because of COVID-19. And as we've seen tonight, the district is still working on and with an extended COVID-19 learning plan. And that's a plan that, you know, we can make a plan, but we can't, there are so many things we can't control and so many unknowns. Um, and of course, the district is gonna have to make these preparations during an economic crisis in which consumer spending is down, which means that state sales tax are down, which means that there's a huge shortfall in terms of school funding. Um, the additional money that lawmakers have provided for schools over the summer is probably mostly gonna be eaten up by costs related to the pandemic and nobody knows what the state budget is gonna look like in 2021. And uh, Michigan's unique approach to funding schools makes it complicated, to say the least, to increase the amount of money available for education. And uh, you know, in any case, we know that Isabella County has the highest poverty rate in Michigan. Approximately 50% of the students in Mount Pleasant Public Schools are economically disadvantaged. This just is not a district that's going to be able to create any easy financial fixes if there are easy financial fixes to be found anywhere. Um, so while the pandemic is an immediate challenge, budgeting is both an immediate and a long-term issue. Um, I expect that schools are going to be asked to do more with less for some time. Um, my hope is that we can quickly assess what we've learned over the past several months and use that as a springboard for some really innovative thinking. I also hope that we can find new ways to serve every student, whatever their background, whatever their home situation, whatever their learning style, whatever their needs. And I think that if we can do all this, we can maybe emerge from this crisis stronger. Thank you. I think Sheila was next. Um, what do you consider Mount Pleasant's greatest strengths? Um, I have already shared some of my thoughts about the board meetings that focused on reopening schools, and I'd like to add how deeply impressed I was by the passion, the eloquence, and the thoughtfulness of the educators who spoke up in those meetings. Um, I agree with Audra Drain that there's no question that Mount Pleasant Public Schools are filled with dedicated teachers and staff who are absolutely committed to doing everything they can for their students. Um, I know from talking to um, Mount Pleasant Public School employees that they have been working around the clock to give students the best possible experience this semester. And I was um, honestly really heartened to hear tonight how our schools are focusing on social and emotional well being while students who are experiencing the same worry and disruption that everyone else is um, are acclimating to new learning environments. Uh, my husband teaches at CMU, and I know how challenging it's been for him and for a lot of our friends to adjust to the hybrid model that the university has adopted. Helping students learn online requires a whole new approach to learning, and that's not even taking into account the inevitable technological glitches. Doing this while also managing face-to-face -face classrooms that have also been totally transformed requires flexibility, patience, and I think superhuman levels of energy and enthusiasm. Um, this is something else we've heard about tonight. Um, I think it says a lot about Mount Pleasant's teachers that they advocated for a hybrid model, knowing that they would be doing some intense on-the-job training and adding substantially to their workloads this semester. Um, watching these professionals adapt so that they can best serve their students has given me faith that re really no challenge should be insurmountable for Mount Pleasant Public Schools. Thank you. Um, what would you like to see changed in the district and how do you envision your role in that change? Um, I know I keep talking about those board meetings on July 27th and August 3rd, but I really learned a lot at those meetings. Um, 
On July 27th, the board listened to a lot of educators, parents, and other community members who had just a host of questions and concerns about reopening schools. This was just a month before this fall trimester was scheduled to begin. Parents were trying to make some really difficult decisions. Teachers and staff didn't seem to have a clear idea of how they were going to do their jobs, you know, in a lot of, with a lot of specificity. Um, the board listened, the board asked questions, board members shared their views, and the board ultimately decided to postpone a vote until on reopening on the plan to reopen schools so that the superintendent and administrators could revisit the plan in light of public comment. So I, I know that these particular meetings were extraordinary events in extraordinary times, but to my mind, they were kind of an extreme version of what a school board meeting should look like. Um, I'm not saying that typically school board meetings should be four hours of angst and drama, but I do think that dialogue is healthy and I think that the board has an opportunity right now to foster continued engagement with Mount Pleasant citizens. Um, so I was looking at the bylaws today um, and this, the board's bylaws today, and this really jumped out at me. Um, the board declares and reaffirms its intent to maintain two-way communications with citizens of the district. The board shall keep them informed of the progress and the problems of the school district, and the citizens shall be urged to bring their aspirations and concerns about the district to the attention of this body. Um, I know that members of the public are welcome to share their views with the board, um, but, I, and I, and I truly think that the board could do more to, as the bylaws say, maintain two-way communication between the board and our community. I think that would benefit all the citizens of the district and it would help the board fulfill its mission as a representative body. Thank you. Okay. Um, we were on, sorry, we were on <laughs> guys, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. How do you view the relationship between the Board of Education and the administration and staff? Okay, so, so as I've just mentioned, I've been familiarizing myself with the board's bylaws today, and I found this. Um, the board has the dual responsibility for implementing statutory requirements pertaining to public education and for meeting the desires of residents. Um, to put this in my own words, the Board of Education is entrusted by the community to ensure that students receive the education to which they are entitled under the law. And also as officials elected by the community, the board should function as a liaison between the community and the schools. Um, I won't list all the specific responsibilities of the board, but if I understand correctly, it's the board's job to make decisions about policies, curricula, staffing, uh, facilities management, and budgeting, among other things. Um, the board works directly with the superintendent. The superintendent works with school administrators. The administrators work with teachers and staff. And if all of these relationships are healthy relationships, the board's decisions should ultimately be collaborative decisions. And if we bring this back to where I started, the board fulfills its public trust obligation when its decisions are informed by the needs and views of community members. Thank you. John. Uh, why should we select you over, over other applicants? Um, education professionals are well represented on the board. There are also several career educators running for board seats that are up for, up for election. And I mean, that makes perfect sense. But I also think that there's room on the board for other kinds of experience and expertise. Um, my background in the private sector gives me perspective that I think can be useful to the board. I've talked a lot about communication tonight, and my entire career has been about communication, whether that means writing articles for general audiences, putting together email newsletters, or helping clients navigate social media. Um, I think I would be a valuable complement to the educators who are currently serving on the board and the new members who will join the board in January. Thank you. And then lastly, is there anything else you would like us to know that will help us with our decision? Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, I don't wanna minimize the hardship families have endured over the past several months. And I know that this has been a uniquely challenging time for everyone involved in educating our students. 
But as we are being compelled by circumstances beyond our control to reinvent public school, I think we have an opportunity to actually reimagine public schools. And we can explore new technologies and new pedagogies, of course, because we're gonna have to. But as we rebuild, we can also envision new ways to make our schools more equitable and more inclusive so that all students can thrive. It would really be an honor to be part of that process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. We appreciate it again. We appreciate you stepping up and becoming a member of the offer to become a member of the board. And thank you for being a part of our community um, and supporting us. The next candidate is Wileen Pengel. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, how are you, Wileen? Good, and I, I do have to, uh, to teach you how to say my name at some point, so maybe I'll do it today. It's Wileen, uh, just, you know, I, I figured at some point I had to do that. That's perfectly fine. Thank you for doing that. You're welcome. Thank you for having me tonight. Yes. The first question is, Wileen, is why are you interested in serving on the board? I feel a strong responsibility to help support our community, and I do believe that the school board is when, where I can be most effective at this. I'm a mother of two students in the district. I do have first-hand experience of how our schools operate, and I have visited schools weekly to supplement the science curriculum. As a CMU biology faculty, I lead K through 12 teacher workshops that address inquiry in the classroom, and more recently, how to maintain that inquiry even when we are doing uh, virtual learning. And then as a scientist, I handle data daily, I navigate scientific information, and I manage budgets. I have a strong desire to help the community that I live in, and I think that given, given my unique skill set I just described, I would be a good asset on our board. Thank you. John? Uh, what are the challenges currently facing Mount Pleasant, Mount Pleasant Public Schools? I think there's quite a few. Um, and as Jessica just outlined, I do believe that budget is a big one. Um, and so I'll skip this one, but I would like to uh, briefly outline three other challenges. I think first and foremost is keeping our students, teachers, and staff safe in the middle of a pandemic. And our second challenge, I believe, is maintaining high educational standards despite this pandemic. And I do think that, unfortunately, these two challenges might be working against each other because our current model in Mount Pleasant is only viable because a third of our students have opted for online learning. By removing these students from the physical classroom, it allowed us to ensure we can follow proper social distancing. However, it also has put a very large burden on some of our teachers that are now faced, as we've talked tonight, with two different set of students and on over two different modalities. Um, and so I do think that the, we, we do have to make sure that all our students receive high education, no matter the modality and the amount, no matter uh, what their families have chosen. And then last but not least, I do think that thinking beyond the pandemic, we have to address as a district questions of inclusivity. Thank you. Hang on. Okay. Um, where am I at? What, what do you consider the greatest strengths? I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record, but I think it's our people. Our people care, and it's really obvious. We have amazing teachers. We have dedicated staff and administration. No matter who they are in the system, they care. And then I'm going to add that our community cares. And I think it was quite extraordinary throughout the summer to see the high attendance at our school boards when they were in my public. I mean, it was in hundreds to hear even the concerns of the parents, even when there were negative comments, that they care, they're engaged, and they want to help, um, and they want to be part of that conversation. We have so many volunteers. I have volunteered over the years, and I'm certainly not the only one. And so to me, it's people, whether it's people within our educational system or our community. What would you like to see changed in the district, and how do you envision your role in that change? There are two changes I'd like to address tonight. The first one will be to strengthen our Oilers online program. I am teaching online myself. I have for many years. And so I believe that I do understand the tools available, the restrictions that come with online teaching, but also the opportunities that online teaching can provide. The second is strengthen communication, especially with our community members. I do believe that the board and administration are so often involved in wonderful measures 
And unfortunately, a lot of the time, our community is not aware of the work that you guys are doing behind the scene. Um, I think that um, communication that's transparent and frequent is particularly critical in this time of crisis. Thank you. How do you view the relationship between the Board of Education and the administration staff? I think it's a very strong partnership, and I believe it goes way beyond a simple oversight. Uh, if we look at the Michigan Association of School Board documents that they provide every year, they highlight in there the five key roles that um, school boards have, uh, and most of them outline a direct relationship between administration staff and that school board. And these roles involve uh, a number of things that we've witnessed you guys do over the years from setting goals for the district, providing leadership, and then following up on these, ensuring that these goals have actually been accomplished. I find that as part of a good partnership is being a good listener and a good problem solver. And I do believe that my experience as a faculty member, grant writer and scientist has made me strong in both of these skills. So why should we select you over the other applicants? Well, it's a tricky question because until tonight, I hadn't heard some of the other applicants. I have not seen their resumes. I don't know their qualifications. And so as such, I can only talk about myself tonight. I'm qualified. As I presented uh, earlier tonight, I believe I have a unique skill set that complements well our current board. In addition, I'm ready. I've been attending board meetings virtually and in person for years. I understand what it means to be a board member. I can navigate the language and I believe I can hit the ground running right now if I am appointed. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us uh, that might help us make this decision? Yes, I'm hoping you can see today that I'm truly passionate about education, but I'm also a trained scientist. I have a PhD in zoology. I understand what a virus is, the consequences of a pandemic, and I think I could help navigate the science associated with COVID-19 during this pandemic. I hope that I'll be given this opportunity to serve my community by becoming a school board member, and I thank you for your time. Malene, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you have been a big contributor to the board, and you've been to many meetings. So I appreciate that um, commitment, and I appreciate you standing up and to be a, a candidate for the appointment. So those are our three candidates. Um, Ms. Eileen, Eileen Pangel, um, Jessica Jervigan, and Andrea Drain. Um, uh, so board members, um, this is our opportunity to have a conversation um, and make us see what we'd like to do about who we'd like to appoint. Does anyone have any ideas of, um, it's going to be challenging because quite frankly, they're all three seem very talented and they all three can bring something to our board. Um, and so I actually feel very um, excited to have these uh, great three candidates stepping forward for our board. Um, does anyone have any comments or would like to start the conversation in any specific area? Okay, um, <clears throat> I, I agree. I think we have three phenomenal um, people who could each would do the good, good job. I think my concern is if we if we pick one of the ones that are running and then they get elected and then we have to go back through a whole, you know, I, I, I think that's almost, it's, it's could cause problems, you know, or not problems, but it's going to create, do they choose to do this two year or the six year? Um, so I guess if I had clarification that, you know, if they chose to do the two year or the six year, or the two year, then the, then it would be all taken care of. That kind of comes into it, but we're not really quite sure in how that's going to work yet. So in general, we don't know, and that's uh, something that we don't have a lot of control over. So my recommendation would be to try to determine who we feel would be the best fit for the board now, as if the election wasn't there to move forward, um, okay. because we don't know what's going to happen with the election. But there are seven candidates running. Um, there's just too many variables. It's too hard for us to, to take that into consideration. So I would, I would prefer to look at it through the idea of, you know, who would be the best fit um, for this two year seat um, for the, on the board. Okay, because it's a possibility all three of them would end up on the board. 
All right. Tim, just a, a process question. The, the, we have the ability to have conversations and or motions at this point or just conversation? We can have conversation and or a motion. Um, there are, that's all, those are all options. Um, we could talk about the position that's open and maybe looking at what are some characteristics of, uh, we feel that we need for the board and then trying to identify which of the candidates would fill that, that those characteristics that we feel that we need. That might be a, a nice way to have a little conversation. Um, 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 I think Jessica, one of them I mentioned that there's a lot of educators on the board and there really isn't. There's, um, in fact, right now, most, this is two of us who are kind of in the education field um, on the board right now, full fledged. So, um, um, so what can maybe what kind of qualities do we feel that we need um, moving forward? Um, well, Tim, I just want to start by saying that, uh, yeah, all, all three of the candidates sound like they would be great choices and, and would bring a lot to the board. Um, but obviously we can't pick all three. So the way my brain works is, you know, um, what, kind of skills or assets could fill in any type of gaps we might have um, or be particularly useful in the moment. And so although all three uh, candidates um, stand out, there, there's one that stands out the most to me. Um, I, think, I think Dr. Pangle, um, not only is she an educator, um, she's a role model, she's a female scientist, she's a scientist having an uh, a published scientist on on the board I think is a big deal um, but then her expertise is also in biology um, so I think that um, with all that that brings to the table that uh, I'd, I'd feel comfortable moving forward with a motion for Dr. Pangle. Just before we move forward, Courtney are you still on? I keep seeing your number yeah. popping up. I just I'm here. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure because you're on the phone, mm -hmm. it's a little different. Um, so there's a motion from Brandon for Dr. Pangle. Um, um, is there a second I or? A motion. This is Courtney. Courtney, can you say that one more time, please? I'd like to second that motion. Okay, so we have a motion and we have a second for Dr. Pangle. Is there any further discussion? I do think that um, all three would make a, a great addition to the board. Um, does anybody else have any thoughts on where the board might be lagging at this time? Um, I know we all kind of bring our own unique strengths and I know that was kind of touched on and I'm, I'm just wondering if anybody has an opinion on that. That's a good question, Amy. It's a hard I don't question. Know if there is a one concrete answer, so it's fine if no one else, you know, is able to speak to that. I was just asking. So, if I were to think broadly on what we need as a board. Um, um, you know, I'd like to see more tribal representation. I would like to see some more diversity representation on the board. Um, I think, um, um, and knowing that, um, you know, Brandon's coming off and John's coming off, so that's some business, right? We still have Sheila who has business connection to the business community, but um, that's another component that um, we, um, probably would like to have more voice on the board. Um, you know, being that I and you, Amy, work from the university, we tend to have more university um, connections in some way. Um, you know, maybe mid-Michigan connection could be a different population. Um, um, knowing that Brandon's coming off, um, 
Brandon has always brought in a great, unique perspective that we often don't understand, and he's very eloquent in sharing his life experiences and how that's contributed to us making decisions, and that's another great area that I think the board can have some support in. That would be a great area, though. So that's kind of my, been my thoughts, um, as I'm always thinking through, you know, especially when we were looking at people to, uh, for applying, you know, who would I approach um, to see if they were interested, and those are kind of the thoughts that I had. Um, and that's one thing I think we've been very lucky with on our board is we've had great diversity of perceptions. Um, we've had moms and we've had dads and we've had non-school district people who don't have kids in the district. And, you know, there's lots of kinds of people that have all contributed to the conversation. And I think that's one reason why we do function pretty well as a board because we have all of those perceptions. Um, so uh, that's kind of my thought. So we have a motion in a second for Dr. Pangle. Is there any other discussion? So John, I guess we have the opportunity for a vote. Amy Bond. Yes. Courtney Stegman. Yes. Brenda McQueen. Yes. John Mazurkovich, yes. Sheila Murphy? Yes. Tim Odekirk? Yes. So the motion is approved. So we lean. Welcome to the board. Um, Jessica and Audra, thank you very much for coming forward. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm sure you can kind of feel our, in our conversation the difficulty that we were having in, in this process of identifying who would be um, a candidate that would be good for this position. Um, so thank you very much for stepping forward. Um, we really appreciate that. Um, so the next item on the agenda is actually the oath of office that we will be giving, actually Jen will be giving to Eileen. I have to say this is very odd, <laughs> but I'm here. Yes, it is very odd. Thank you for rolling with it. Well, well thank you. To ask, do you have video? <laughs> I do have video. I could turn it on. I don't know on my. It have to be on Jennifer's end. Yep. Let me just. I'm. I'm working on making you a panelist right now. So I've now promoted you to panelist. Okay, and I can turn on the video. Yep. Hello. Hi. There you go. Hi. Well, congratulations, Eileen. Thank you very much. So, Eileen, just to just to help clarify why Jen's getting prepared. So, we are a constitutional officer of the state of Michigan, and so we actually have to do a constitutional oath. Um, it's a very formal, very important thing to understand because we are becoming part of the government of the United States of the state of Michigan, actually, because K-12 education is controlled by the state of Michigan. Um, so you will have to do the weird thing of raising your right hand, but I'll let Jen walk you through some of that yeah. stuff. Okay. You ready, Jen? Yes, I am. So Dr. Pingle, I'll lead you through this process. Okay. So I, Dr. Waylon Pingle. I, Dr. Weedin Pingle. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support. That I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of this state. The Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of this state. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties. And that I will faithfully discharge the duty. Of the Office of Member of the Board of Education. Of the Office, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Of the Office of Member of the Board of Education. Of the Office of Member of the Board of Education. Of the Mount Pleasant Public Schools. Of the Mount Pleasant Public School. In Isabella County, Michigan. In Isabella County, Michigan. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my avail avail availability. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. And don't worry, Raylene, um, everyone stumbles on that part because it's very awkward and you just have to roll with it. Yes, that's So thank you very mean. much. So welcome to the board. Thank um, you. And, and so, um, 
as we had mentioned, we actually have a board meeting on Thursday, um, but we are going to continue with our board meeting agenda at this time. So the next item on the agenda is any citizen who wishes to address the board on any agenda or non-agenda item. Um, I'm going to have Jen who's going to be the one managing this process. So for any of our um, public uh, community members that are attending the board meeting this evening, we'll do like we've done the last several meetings. If you would like to raise your virtual hand, I will enable your um, talking so that you can share your comments with the board. Michelle, are you there? I am here. Hi, we can hear you, go ahead. I, um, I just wanted to say really quick um, how much I appreciate everything that the staff is doing. I have talked to a few teachers, I can't speak for all of them, but I know your teachers right now are completely overwhelmed and I'm hoping that there's a good solution you guys can find to help them with that. They don't have any downtime in their day or anything, but I just really appreciate the fact that my students, one of them is doing virtual and she's being taught by a Mount Pleasant educator, not an outsourced thing as some other schools are doing. So I'm hoping that maybe they can get some help in some way. I don't have a good answer as to what that is, but I just really want to express my appreciation to all of the staff of what they are doing. So just to know that they're appreciated during this time. Thank you, Michelle. If anyone else would like to share a comment, if you want to raise your virtual hand. Okay, Jenny, are you seeing any others? There, there, there's no one else right now that has raised their virtual hand. So again, I'll just give our attendees one last opportunity. If you would like to share any comments, um, please raise your virtual hand and I would enable talking for you. Oh, here we go. One moment. Jessica, are you there? Yes. Okay, go I just, ahead. I just want to say congratulations, Weileen. Thank you. Good choice. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Jessica. Is there anyone else that would like to share a comment with the board this evening? So I'm not seeing anything, so we will go on the agenda. Um, the next item on the agenda is the Board of Education discussion. Um, there are three items that are down there. Um, one is the Mid-Michigan College discussion. Um, this is in regards to the upcoming um, November ballot. We just wanted to make a connection with MidMish that to know that they have on the ballot the choice to have Isabella and Gratiot counties or the Gratiot Isabella RESDs counties join Mid Michigan as part of the college. So currently, it is just the the, the, um, the, the county of Harrison, right, Jen? So it's just that county. And so it, we have the ability to vote to join um, them as a community um, and one and then two there's also a vote to do financial support um, with increasing the tax base from the, our counties to support them um, and so we wanted to bring that to our attention um, because mid michigan is one of our partners um, and we would like to support them in any way that we could so can I just share a little bit of additional information, if that's okay, Tim? So it is a, an annexation proposal for Michigan um, College. 
in the state of Michigan, community colleges are organized by the boundaries of uh, regional educational service districts. <clears throat> Excuse me. So right now, Mid Michigan College is organized um, solely by the boundaries of Clare and Gladwin County. So they work with the Clare Gladwin RESD. This annexation proposal would allow them to include the counties of Gratiot and Isabella. The biggest benefit to our students and to our communities is that there's a significant difference in in-district versus out-of-district tuition. It's as much as 40% additional to pay out-of-district tuition. So although Isabella County is one of the uh, largest student bases for Min Michigan College, our residents have always paid about 40% more in tuition to attend Mid Michigan College than residents of Clare Gladwin County. So that's important for us when we look at down the road, our technical education center, and we look at the number of articulation agreements we have from leaving Gratiot Isabella Technical Education Center, going to Mid Michigan College, where students have significant options for articulated credit, or even our graduates going to Mid Michigan College first and then transferring to a four year university, there are also significant um, articulation agreements between a wide variety of universities across the state. So it's a huge benefit to our students in our community to be able to receive in, uh, in district tuition rates. That's what this annexation proposal would allow us to do. Um, it is based on um, an, an increase in taxes in um, Gratiot and Isabella counties. Um, for board members, um, I can send you the, the link to the Mid Michigan College website so you can look at that exact dollar amount. Um, but I believe for the average home in Isabella County, it's about $6 a month. Uh, there was an article in the Morning Sun that um, had an inaccurate number in there. They put the yearly increase as the monthly increase. So it made quite a bit of a difference, but it would for the average household in Isabella County, it would increase your taxes approximately $6 a month. So we just wanted to make sure that that information was shared with our board and shared with our community members so that they understand the importance of um, this ballot proposal in the November election. Any clarifying, clarifying questions? The next item on the agenda is some correspondence from Alexander de Matai. Um, so Alexander is actually a member of the Youth Advisory Committee, which is part of the Mid Mount Pleasant Area Community Foundation. And the Youth Advisory Committee um, actually has decided that they wanted to do a, uh, a, a kind of a book study idea. And so they have offered up the book, The Hate You Give, and they are trying to get students who are in grades six to 12 to read this library, this book. And they are going to initiate some conversations um, on September 16th with a virtual panel. Um, and so they wanted, this is one of the ways that they as students wanted to make an impact on some of the diversity issues going on in our community and give us a book to have a conversation regarding um, that topic. Um, the virtual panel will actually have um, several people on it. Um, Olivia Clark, Dr. Vincent Mumford, Australia Coleman, and Monica Dijator. Um, and they will be um, through a process of uh, sharing and ex explore racism in modern day America is what they're calling it. Um, Alexander reached out to us to share um, that this book, The Hate You Give, is actually free and it is available at the Chippewa River District Library to pick up um, for students to read and get engaged. Again, they are trying to focus this conversation around sixth to 12th graders um, being supported by their youth advisory committee of the Community Foundation. I mean, I had said that I would share that information. Um, the YAC also has more information on their Facebook page or the Mount Pleasant Area Community Foundation Facebook page if you are looking for more information on it. Um, and there is a poster, but I'm sure if you go to the website for the Mount Pleasant Area Community Foundation, um, there will be more in-depth information. Um, but this is another great way that we are helping our K2, our 612 students um, go through having and explore racism in modern day America. Um, the next is correspondence from Shannon Recker. Um, that 
in that correspondence is actually in your board packet. Um, and it's in regard to the K2 um, hybrid structures and some of the challenges that uh, Ms. Recker is having um, that she wanted to share with the board. And so we wanted to make sure that you saw that. But we've already had a lot of conversation about that earlier when Jen did her presentation about what the status of the district is and where it's going. Um, I would like to add a couple other things that I've noticed lately. One is I would like to give um, a big thank you to the Student Senate. Um, I don't know if you all saw it, but the Student Senate put out a words of advice for the freshman class video on Facebook. Um, they did a phenomenal job. And I would really, even their words of advice were very, very, very valuable. I just wanted to thank them to do the, for them to do that effort and put that out there for our freshman class, especially since they don't, they're not as connected and moving into a new building. To have upperclassmen provide those words of advice in that format, I was very impressed. And I wanted to, to thank Student Senate for that, um, that um, posting. Um, I thought it was just really wonderful. And the last thing I'd like just to say for the evening is I wanna thank the students and the families for showing their, their grace and their patience as the district got up and going in a totally new way. Um, it's been challenging for everyone. Um, I, the board, the administration, everyone understands this, but I'm very impressed with how well they actually did do it with patience and grace. And so I wanted to thank the community um, for helping and partnering as we're trying to figure this out and move forward. Um, it's been a, um, one of those ironic things, uh, uh, an extremely challenging time in our community, but we always seem to step up and have um, the power to show that who we are as a community and what we are as a district um, shines through when we're most challenged. So I wanted to thank the families and the students for their commitment um, and the work that they're doing, trying to keep everything moving forward. Does any other board members have anything else that they would like to to share. Jen, just one of the, real quick, um, one of my concerns over the past couple months was, um, you know, how, how policing the, the, not policing, but um, how much cooperation you were going to get from the students and how much time teachers were going to spend trying to ensure social distancing. Can you speak to how that's been going? Are you getting good collaboration with the students? Or is there anything yeah. that we'd be getting out to the parents to say, hey, you know, we need to do better? That, that's a great question. Um, I will tell you, you know, part of our planning process was um, <clears throat> sharing some concerns and anxiety about um, more of the mask compliance piece. You know, would we have a lot of arguments about wearing masks? Would we have young children that weren't capable of wearing masks? Or even our students with special education needs that weren't able to wear masks? and um, in my casual conversations, I've not done a full formal survey, but in my casual conversations with staff, it does really seem like mask compliance is going very well, that even our youngest students are able to wear their masks. Um, you know, I think everyone sort of loves that opportunity to be outside and be more than six feet apart and be able to take their mask down for a few minutes, but it does really seem like our mask compliance is going very well. Um, with the social distancing piece, um, I think that that's a little bit more of a challenge, but it's not necessarily um, an adversarial situation. It's more of a situation where we have to constantly rem remind our students that they need to stay apart from one another. Um, and I'll be really honest, I find myself in a situation where we have to remind adults of that as well, right? We are, we are social beings, and so we want to, we're naturally drawn towards one another. So uh, that seems to be more of the challenge, um, especially during our unstructured times. Um, but the way our day is structured right now, we really don't have as many unstructured times as we normally do. Classes aren't moving like they normally would. Students are staying in their classrooms and with their cohorts more. So I really feel like that compliance piece of both the social distancing and mask wearing um, has gone very well. Um, and, and I think that our, our staff members would share that as well. So I don't know, Linda, if you've heard uh, anything different that you wanna share? No, I've been very impressed every time I visit a building. My, one of my favorite comments to make is, good job wearing your mask, thank you for wearing your mask. Um, I haven't heard any complaints or arguments about that at all. And 
I think it, they've been, I think they're so thankful to be back and be out and about that um, they're doing very well following all the rules and protocols. I also think that our buildings have done a really great job with signage. And so that makes it very clear and easy to follow. Um, if you go to Mount Pleasant High School, tables are very clearly laid out where students can sit, where they can't sit. There's arrows in the hallway, there's signs all over, reminding students to wear their mask all the time. So I feel like our, our signage has really helped with students, um, just knowing that this is the expectation. I'm uh, at the middle school every day for drop off, so I do appreciate the signage. That's great. Um, my only request is <clears throat> that you keep us informed, especially with the blended learning situation. Um, you know, what options you've come up with and that type of thing. You know, anything we can do to help the staff, if, if you need us to do it, let us know. Um, I do appreciate it having um, been in that position myself of having to run a business by myself for a number of weeks. I understand being overwhelmed. Um, it's not easy, uh, you know, for anybody. So we appreciate it and I under appreciate how hard it is. And I just want everybody to know that we, we are trying to find solutions and we're not just poo-pooing them. It's going to be yeah, awesome. I <laughs> can I Can I go ahead? I, don't, I didn't mean to interrupt Jennifer. Um, I would like to bring maybe to our attention, I, I really appreciate the conversation with the concerns for the K through two, but I have have had a lot of concerns and have heard a lot of parents complaining about the online, the orders online for the middle school. And from what I've experienced, I think we also um, need to step up there and to change a little bit what's going on. Um, to give you an idea, and I'm speaking about my daughter, but I think she's representative of a large group. My sixth grader has gotten 22 minutes of live instructions in the nine days of school. No self-basic instruction. Um, really, I mean, she basically gets a whole load of stuff every morning at 7.35, some of it very high quality, but to expect an 11 uh, year old to self base and self teach, I think is not what we want to do as a district. I do believe it's the beginning that teachers are getting their feet wet. I get it. Um, but I, I would really like that on our radar um, moving forward. What can we do to maybe help our teachers, whether it's train them in a high flex like where they turn on their cameras during live instruction uh, to the morning students so that the online, order, uh, online learners can participate. This to me seems like the easier fix or help um, underwhelm them a little bit from their heavy load so that their afternoons can be get dedicated to this. Um, but that is a real concern of mine moving forward. The other issue I've had with the middle school is that contrary to what the community was told during the summer months, the face-to-face -face students have opportunities that the online do not, the online students do not, especially advanced math. And if you're not in a sixth grade advanced math, you're not getting into seventh myth, uh, advanced math. And the fact that the face-to-face -face kids are getting it and not the onliners has been something that's really upset um, myself, a lot of parents, uh, when we learned that on the first day. And so I don't know if we, I think at this point, from what I understand, we have six weeks to fix it in that the curriculum is similar, advanced or not, for the first six weeks. Um, but I would love to see if we could put, put something in place for our um, Oilers online. Yeah, it's definitely something that we can look into. Um, I guess when you talk about six week, you're talking about a specific curriculum length. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I do think that we also have to look at when we can make adjustments to our programming so that it's not um, arbitrary. I mean, I think we need to look at our natural breaks and, and really look at gathering that feedback in a formal way so that we do have the opportunity to hear from a wide variety of families and staff members and, and try to bring that together. But um, it's definitely, I think all of our virtual programs are on our radar for investigation, knowing that um, this is really our first attempt at creating an academically rigorous virtual program. And so we need to uh, constantly be revisiting what we're doing and making sure we're making improvements.
Does any other board member have any other comments that they'd like to make? The last thing I'd like to say is thank you to the new staff and welcome to Mount Pleasant Public Schools. You're coming in at an exciting time. Um, it's going to be a good ride. Um, it's a good place to work. So I think you've heard that today. Um, there's the, our staff and our people that we have are great people. So welcome um, to join our great staff and we thank you for stepping into um, the school year when it's kind of a crazy school year. Um, that being everything before the board this evening, I will call this meeting adjourned. Good night, everyone. Thank good night. you. Have a good night. I have